Hi everyone, my name is Matt Landis. I'm with NGDU and I lead the Serious Games Tech Talk series and we are ecstatic to have uh, some folks from the University of Groningen and Luarden in the Netherlands along with Grendel Games uh, who are jointly developing a game for surgeons. Um, and we're going to be some of the first people to be able to play, uh, play with and take a look at some of the demos of the current version of their game. Uh, and we're hoping that this is going to be one of the first simultaneous uh, serious and commercial game launches on a major platform. So please join me in welcoming Hank, Tim, and Yetzi. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start with some videos. So you might ask yourself, what does a robot, a girl, some, uh, some mining planet fr uh, uh, far away has to do with surgery, or at least learning the motor skills of surgery. And that's what we're here for today. We're going to demo and going to tell about the whole process of making this game, this seriously entertaining game for the Nintendo Wii. Um, which trains you basic laparoscopic surgical skills. And to tell you all about this, um, we brought a surgeon Henk Tenkate Hoedemaker, that's very Dutch, impronounceable probably for all of you. Henk Tenkate Hoedemaker, and uh, he's gonna tell you about what laparoscopy is and how we came up with making this game. So. Thanks. Uh, minimal invasive surgery or laparoscopy is around now for uh, about more than 20 years. Um, it, it is still struggling with uh, one of the major problems that we were encountered with in the beginning. Um, we are a sort of combination uh, where, where we are at the moment with developing this, this game. We cooperate between the university hospital, another, another hospital in, in Leeuwarden, and the software developer Grendel Games, and we joined up to produce uh, the company called Cutting Edge. So it's all about laparoscopy. Laparoscopy is around for a very, very long time now, and we are still struggling with the same problem. So the problem with laparoscopy is, there are, in fact, there are many problems. We're working with long tools, and we introduce a sort of port in the, in the abdominal or in the thoracic wall, and through that port we introduce uh, instruments. The problem is that from there on it becomes a little bit uh, clumsy and, um, and difficult, because what is happening, all your movements are reversed, we call it the fulcrum effect. So you introduce an instrument and if you want to move the tip to the left, you have to move the, the handle to the right and vice versa. So that makes it uh, not intuitive for many users. The other problem there is, is that you're working with uh, 2D uh, screens. So you're, you have a complete loss of uh, depth perception. That's the second problem. And the third problem in laparoscopy is that you're working with stiff, rigid instruments. And if you compare it with open surgery, is what you do with your hands, the end result of the movement of your hand is the end, the end result of about 10 joints. So you can make very, very precise sort of movements. And all that is changed now to a rigid instrument. It is more or less where your whole arm is uh, in the plaster of Paris cast, uh, where you only have the function of squeezing your thumb and your index finger. So, that's, so that, those are the, are the problems. So that means that laparoscopy still is a difficult task. So we try to, to train surgeons and residents before they go into theater, and that's on a box like this or other boxes. And we train them uh, according to the uh, FLS, that's the Fundamentals of Laparoscopic Surgery from the Sages, and we try to, to, well, to teach them surgery. Um, it works with, uh, with instruments like, like this, rigid instruments and very simple tasks. This is called uh, the pack transfer and you have to move uh, packs inside a box where you can't see them directly, so you can only watch what you're doing on the television screen and you have to transfer those, those packs from one side to the other side. It's a mechanical task and you can play around for a long time and you get better at it at the end. Another way to train surgeons is with simulators. We have a lot of simulators in our skill center. This is a very, um, very nice one, a very beautiful machine, very, very good, and I think the top of the, of the market at the moment. So we invested in our skill center of about 1 million uh, euros in buying simulators. So this is what we 
imagined what it would, would be like. So a skill center, this is our skill center, a picture of our skill center, full with people fighting to find a place on the simulator. But after a while, this turned out to be the case. So that's very strange. So in fact, we invested a million. All the residents that came in, the first moment they said what, what they said, well, well, wow, this is cool. This is uh, really awesome. Um, but what happened is that after uh, about before the day ended, they were completely fed up with the simulators and they didn't come back. And that's strange because the same users, the, 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 the potential users were gaming day in, day out. So um, they don't have anything against electronics or screens or what else. So, so for, one reason, for one or the other reason, they are not happy with simulators. And we tried to figure out what that was. So the first thing we, uh, we, we knew is that simulators are very effective in teaching um, uh, laparoscopy. We know that from a lot of literature. So if you try to get the residents back on the simulator, there are two ways to get them back. The first one is by, uh, by force. And that's what we do at the moment. We, we tell them, well, you're only allowed in the OR if you are uh, reaching several levels on the simulator. Well, of course, you can force them to use the simulator in this sense. The problem is, as soon as they are finished with the special type of curriculum, they stop using the simulator. And that's a pity because we know that from a lot of work from uh, Butch Rosser and, and the and New York surgeon. He is a real example of, uh, of, of investigation in this sort of surgery. And he knows that if you keep practicing on simulators, you're getting better and better and better. So it never stops. It ends only after you're dead. So there is a good reason for keeping uh, the, the simulator alive. So then we thought, well, what can we do? If it doesn't work with, uh, with force, perhaps we can tease them to use the simulators. But there are enormous differences. And I found out because um, at one moment I was asked to teach in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a symposium in the Netherlands about serious gaming because they thought, well, you have a skill center, you have lots of simulators, so you must be an expert on serious gaming. And only at that moment I found out that there are huge differences between simulators and serious gaming. In a simulator and on the sort of exercises like the pack transfer, uh, what you're doing is only mechanical exercises. So you could be more or less brain death and you could still exercise this sort of exercises. And, that's, and, and the other thing is that the end result of your exercise is predictable. So there is not a real uh, clue or, or a mission or what else. You have to fulfill a mechanical task. Well, in gaming, it's completely different because in gaming, what you do with your hand is completely unimportant. Whether you are using your mouse or your joystick, that's not the important thing. What you are doing is playing a game. It's not for nothing. It's called an immersive game. So you are involved in a, in a story. So that's the difference, and that keeps the people going. So at that moment, I thought, well, perhaps we should join or try to create a marriage between the serious gaming uh, business and, uh, and, and the game business. Why don't we produce an, a game that can be controlled with surgical tools? So instead of using a joystick or a mouse, use a sort of surgical tools to manipulate the game. So that was the basis of the whole idea. Then we found out that probably the Nintendo Wii was certainly at that moment, but it still is, the only platform that's capable of fulfilling this sort of task. It has a very precise uh, motion capturing uh, device because we looked in the professional business as well for motion capturing devices and they were too clumsy, too expensive because we wanted to have something that is affordable um, and, that's, uh, and that's very practical in, in the use. So we came to the Nintendo Wii and from there on, I was Googling to find a software company that could help us with developing a game. And that's how we came to uh, Tim Laning from Gendel Games and Jan Jaap Severs. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Tim Laning. I'm here together with uh, uh, my co-founder and co-owner of uh, Grendel Games. We're a serious game company. And uh, we got a phone call uh, from uh, uh, Hank uh, to see if there was a possibility that we could come up with an immersive design uh, for lower laparoscopic surgery training. So we, uh, uh, we started working on the prototype. Uh, on this very picture, you see the first prototype controller that we uh, uh, developed uh, together. Uh, as you can see, it utilizes a nunchuck uh, and a Wii remote for both the left and, uh, and the right hand. But this was a bit big. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we uh, presented it first at uh, the GDC Series Game Summit and afterwards at the, the Games for Health in Boston. It came in a suitcase that was about a, a square cubic uh, meter. Um, so that was, uh, that was fun. Um, and there's no way that this is uh, going to be distributed. But what this thing did was basically prove that we could actually come up with a device that works on consumer-grade hardware and that uh, allows you to interface, actually, with, a, with an entertainment uh, system. So we were all very happy with that. And it was uh, basically the start of, uh, uh, of a far better cooperation, cooperative effort. What you see here is the, prototype, the, the new prototype controller. This is not going to be the final product, but at least it showcases uh, what it can look like. The base underneath is uh, a, a lot smaller than a Wii Fit, uh, as you uh, can imagine. Uh, on the top, uh, the nunchuck uh, is inserted, uh, and on the very uh, forward slide, the Wii Remote is inserted, and you can just do laparoscopic surgery with a device like this by simply uh, putting in, uh, by taking a, a hunk of plastic, by inserting uh, a couple of uh, Wii remotes and a couple of nunchucks, and you can get some staggering results uh, on which Yes is going to elaborate uh, uh, in a few minutes. Uh, we do game design, uh, so we came up with, um, with figuring out how to basically remove all medical context, where, because uh, one of the problems of the simulators is, is that they're not games, they're not games at all. I mean, uh, some people call them serious games, but in fact they're just training motor skills with comparative uh, uh, medical uh, context, but the medical context is exactly what puts these re residents off. I mean, they've been confronted with this the entire day. They need to go to a skills lab at night to be able to train this stuff, which is not very, very attractive. So we came up with uh, a couple of analogies that would explain uh, or would relate to the, uh, uh, the, uh, the practices that you need to do. So we came up with a piece of narrative because we think that's important in a game to at least get uh, a feeling of a place uh, to give it a context. Uh, what you see here is uh, one of the designs of our robot. Uh, there are a whole lot of robots uh, in our game and uh, uh, we came up with a game uh, design that basically is something of a merger between Lemmings. I don't know if any of you know Lemmings. Uh, Lemmings and the Incredible Machine and perhaps a little hint of a, a game called Ico. Um, the robots uh, are basically mining robots that are abandoned on a planet in a deep crevice that they created themselves because they were mining for minerals for humans and they were left uh, back there. Um, the main character of the story is a robot called Swank and Swank uh, was basically the butler robot of the uh, family that ran the entire mining operation and Swank had a particular job basically look after the daughter of the family called Sari and uh, he had to teach her a lot of stuff uh, he uh, had to make sure that she did her homework, but in fact, she basically reprogrammed him to uh, teach her tango lessons. They were having a, a blast. Dad find out and basically abandoned uh, the robot Swank to the bottom of the crevice, uh, along with the rest of the mining crew, and the little girl goes to look for her friend. So, deep in the underground world, there are a lot of dangers, like this uh, slug uh, that has an appetite for anything that's metal, and it's basically uh, uh, besieging uh, the robots. So what you need to do in the game is basically uh, uh, get scrap metal that's piled up in the underground cavernous world, and uh, smelt that, uh, put it in a mel melter, in a smelter, and uh, create like scaffolds, elevators and stuff to create a route for the girl and the robots to go back up. At the same time, you have to make sure that she doesn't get attacked and that they don't get, get attacked. Um, so here you see one of the snails. <laughs> the real bastards. Um, attacking uh, one of the robots. Um, through this game, we also came up with a lot of designs. There were a lot of the design questions. What you see here are some preliminary results, some sketches from uh, uh, Flora that uh, is in the game world. The vegetation is important because this vegetation has... Uh, has a direct relation to the, uh, to the, to the game itself. Uh, as you will see in a minute, you, uh, we control two large robot arms with the control set, and those robot arms uh, basically 
interact with the game world. So they make sure that you can place bridges, that you can build elevators and things like that. Uh, but you also need power sources. And these power sources are uh, organic growths that are uh, in that cavernous world. So we need to have something tangible uh, to interact with that creates, uh, that is utilized as an energy source. Here you some, see, see some final results. Uh, plant number three uh, is the one uh, on the highest row, the third one with the orange uh, orb in it, uh, is uh, one of the designs that finally made it into the game. We have it in a, in a blue variety. You will see it in the demo in a second. Uh, whenever you try to approach it with one of your hands, the plant closes if you move too fast. So you really have to make a secure movement and try to grab that particular orb uh, before you can utilize this. Utilize this. So you really have to use your high uh, and eye coordination skills, uh, just as you would in laparoscopic surgery. Uh, the placing of the objects uh, needs to be done in an inverse movement kind of way uh, through the control set, which has a relation to the training of laparoscopic surgery skills. Um, uh, the two hands, uh, the two arms, robot arms that are in the game, each have different tools. So they have like drilling machines that you would use to uh, uh, destroy uh, bridges that these slugs make or that you would use to drill scrap metal loose while you hold it with your other hand, the metallic claw, a pincher. And this way you can train, actually, actually train the active and the passive hand as you would in simulations. But it's not a simulator, it's just a game. Um, so uh, we wanted, really wanted a game to have production value, because we feel that's one of the largest problems that, uh, that are out there right now with serious games. Most of them lack production value, so they're no fun at all, they're no fun to look at, and they're no fun to listen to, since they're more of an academic test than actually uh, a video game. What you see here is a picture of a, a, a Californian uh, artist, Michael Maisley. Uh, he has a fantastic dulcimer uh, on which he creates music, and he is actually uh, uh, co-composing the music for the video game. So it has an actual soundtrack. It's an elaborate soundtrack. He will be, he will be cooperating with Charling Weinstra, uh, who is a, a composer and director of opera music uh, in our country, the Netherlands. Um, so it, it's going to have an actual soundtrack as opposed to plink, plonk, plink, plonk, what most of these simulators do. Uh, the animations that you have just seen are provided by GameShip. Uh, we've outsourced them to a local, uh, a local animation studio, local game uh, uh, outsourcing studio uh, that we always closely work with. They also uh, employ students, so they get a chance to actually learn things from this. So it's a, it's a close cooperate, cooperation effort. Um, we pre-recorded some videos that at least show... So what you see here is a pre-recorded uh, gameplay. In this particular level, the objective of the player is to uh, basically get the robots safely to the top. You see them wandering around with, with the blue spheres that they found. Those are the energy spheres. They take elevators up to try to get to their goal. You see the, see the left hand and the right hand. These are the, uh, the hands that you actually control. The left hand has now selected the tweezer, as has the right. As you can see, the robots ha have idle animations. Are looking around, collecting those orbs. And the player actually has to uh, start to uh, inventorize scrap metal to be able to do the building process. So here, he's taking his scrap throwing it down in the melter and you immediately see a couple of options here the left hand is a tweezer and the right hand is a driller he's drilling and releasing the scrap throwing it back into the melter so this is the, the process of um, gathering some of the scrap metal so he has two options either build, a, build an elevator or build a bridge selecting the bridge piece and carefully placing it in the landscape and the robots can cross, cross over to the next tier. As you can see, the corners of the level itself are dark 
Uh, this is not because this is a, a, a badly shot video. This is because actually the laparoscopic surgeon scope uh, only has light in the camera itself. So it's always uh, in a very dark area. By uh, choosing an underground world, uh, we uh, can use this. Here you see one of the slugs creating their bridges. And you see the player selecting a driller to basically destroy those bridges so it can make his own bridges. One of the slugs is coming out. You can use them to death or zap them with the shocker tool. They don't like that. And here you see the player taking one of the orbs out of a, um, a storage place that the robots put it into. Now the elevator is uh, powered and the robots can find their way to safety. So this is a brief uh, demonstration of how we basically transformed the guidelines to laparoscopic surgery to actually came up with good, nice game design rules and it has uh, nothing to do with laparoscopic surgery anymore. Basically it's just become a game about an underground world and a, a little girl and a bunch of robots that need saving badly. Just a, a minor, minor comment on what we try to reach. So we didn't try to, to, to teach procedural skills. So we're, because a lab, a lab coli, for instance, consists out of a lot of difficulties. So it's technical skills and procedural skills. The second part is what we're not trying to do. It's only trying to teach our residents to, to, to have a good three-dimensional uh, sense for, 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 for what is happening in the, in the abdomen. So that's and, and, and work with, with two instruments. So a limited, very limited set of goals we, we try to, to, re, to reach with a game like this. What you could include in an environment like this is, is, is make them aware of the environment. That's not a problem in the OR. It's a, always a very complex uh, sort of working area. So there's information coming from everywhere. And we try to teach that with crew resource management training, a very sort of labor some sort of uh, exercise. But the other, you could try to, to, to implement that as well in a game like this. So this, this is what we are doing at the moment. And now what we needed to know, because about a month, three weeks before we came here, the, uh, the controls were finished. And now we were able to test if an expert would grab those controls and intuitively use them and a novice would have a, a quite long learning curve. So what I did, uh, these, uh, this is still uh, preliminary results and uh, small sample size, but we had 14 uh, uh, laparoscopic uh, novices, never done uh, anything uh, on uh, laparoscopy before, and 11 experts, and we compared those. We made them do an FLS test, the thing you saw, uh, this thing, with the transferring of pegs. This is a validated tool to see uh, what the motor skills of uh, uh, the laparoscopic surgeon uh, are. And we made a custom test level that looks like this. Let's see. Which forced the, uh, forced, that sounds like forced, uh, 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 that um, uh, makes uh, them touch balls inside of a, uh, an, an, an little balls, uh, colored balls on sticks. And this was um, uh, modeled on a standard uh, um, uh, test you have in uh, uh, standard simulators. So we compared the two and we looked at two things. Um, the learning curve, so we, we, we let them do five tries. And we also uh, compared the test uh, that we made, this test, to the FLS test. So if there's, we wanted to see if there was, uh, um, I'm struggling for words here. Um, uh, we, we, were see, uh, uh, we, we were trying to find out if the FLS test, the standardized test, would uh, have the same results as this test. So what you see here is uh, first preliminary resu results. Uh, on the X bar, you see uh, uh, the number of attempts and the time that it took them to complete the task to touch uh, the balls. Um, and um, the green line shows the expert. So at the first try, he needs to familiarize, and then you see that he quickly 
goes to, uh, uh, well, the fastest time that he can do this task in. And the red line uh, shows the novices. And they get there, but much slower, and uh, uh, you see a, a much bigger standard deviation here. So the, the difference between uh, the uh, novices and experts are big. Oh, sorry. I'll, I'll come. Significant. Thank you so much. <laughs> and we also compared the FLS test to uh, um, our test to see if uh, um, the scores on both were correlated. Correlated, that's the word. So what you see here is that um, uh, uh, you see two things. You see the green dots that are the experts. They have fast times to complete the test. Uh, the test. And the red dots are the novices. And you see that there's a beautiful correlation between those two. So our test uh, uh, does the same thing as the LS test. These are still preliminary results. We're doing we're going to do much more results, so um, uh, this same test with a bigger group, and then we're going to test face validity, so uh, ask expert surgeons and surgeons in training if this is something they would like to train with, and after that, there is not that much for us to do anymore, because what we need to do is have other surgeons and other uh, 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 researchers test these uh, this thing. So learning effects and even transfer of skills. So the, the, the skills you're learning on this game, do they transfer to practice? So that's um, my bit wobbly story about the research I've been doing. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to hand over the, the end of the presentation to Tim. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, all so much uh, for for attending this. We, what we'd like to give you, uh, what we'd like to tell you is basically um, that in our uh, vision, this is the future of uh, of games. Uh, basically, we want to get rid of the word serious in uh, serious games. Uh, uh, we think it isn't necessary to put that word in front of it. We think that games uh, teach you something uh, anytime. Um, what you what what is important is that uh, basically, if you can make a game that runs on a consumer grade hardware device like this that actually practices skills, uh, uh, medical skills, um, um, on consumer grade hardware, it becomes possible and it becomes viable to teach a lot of people in the world, also in those countries that don't have a lot of money uh, for a similar a simulator, to teach them sk skills in a fun way basically to train that, those skills, not to teach them, but to train them, I should actually say. Um, and besides that, uh, please keep in mind that this specific set of controllers uh, is very handy to practice those skills. But at the same time, there is just uh, uh, the game has consumer controls, just a regular nunchuck and a regular Wii remote that you can play the game with in a perfect way. So basically, uh, you're opening, uh, you're able to uh, publish a game on one market, uh, whereas most people see them as two, and we think uh, that is not necessary anymore. We thank you for your time, thank you for being here, and uh, we hope uh, to see you uh, soon. So are there, oh sorry. You're going to do the questions? Uh, VC Ops, can you open up for, are there any questions on the bridge? And since uh, we've only got one live mic, so if you want to pose any questions to these guys, and then did you guys also want to do some, were you guys going to do some demo gameplay? Yes, of course. Okay. Yeah. So just repeat the questions there, because that's the only mic that we have. Okay, questions. Um. Can you tell us a little bit about <clears throat> the distribution model? Have you guys thought about that and how, how you go about doing it? And I guess related to that is, um, like, does Nintendo know about this? Is it, are you running on dev kits or retail units? Okay, so what's our distribution model and what does Nintendo think of what we're doing right now? Thank you. Tim Wu. I'll answer that. Um, um, in terms of distribution models, we are currently looking at different business models. You can uh, uh, imagine that uh, with digital distribution, there's a very clear uh, and open place where you can 
actually also build a community and get feedback from that community and basically uh, perfect uh, uh, what you are offering to them. So that's definitely something that we're uh, that we're looking at. Uh, about Nintendo, yes, we have talked to them multiple times and uh, they are aware of the project and they think it's a, a very nice project uh, that it basically uh, shows uh, they're, they're proud that someone has found ways, that multiple people have found ways to uh, utilize their uh, console to do different things. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's basically our game so basically we're the ones that uh, that are doing the development so they absolutely know about it and uh, um, but we basically we pay for our own way we build we get our own dev kits and uh, that, that's how it is thank you any more questions yes, sir. Uh, yeah i think that's a brilliant idea so i'm just curious although it's a game i was wondering if you guys have done some uh, analysis to see how much uh, the precision, since the internal V is pretty, because they're infrared cameras, so the pretty coarse in terms of precision. So I wonder if you guys done any analysis, how much movement uh, uh, yes. with the accuracy? Yes, we did. And what we saw was uh, that it is at least as accurate as uh, the, uh, a standard uh, simulator. We compared it well, not to the most expensive one, but well, an entry-level simulator. It does the well. It has the same accuracy. So yes, we did research on that. Thank you. Um, and there is one um, major major advantage of this setup uh, because most simulators you have to calibrate before you can start. And the fun with the infrared is you, you don't have to calibrate. You are immediately in business, and it's immediately exact. Later on, if you want to try, you can see it in the in one one of the demo versions, because that was, of course, our worst nightmare. That you with the the rods that come out of the prototype, you could touch each other while in the screen it wasn't touching. That's the worst scenario for us. But it really is exact, as you, as you can see, when you use the prototypes. So. When it's in the virtual world touching, it's touching in the in in the real world. So it is quite exactly. Yep. Okay. So the original problem was that students wouldn't use the simulators. What do they think about the game? Uh, what are the reactions uh, of so, the so, target audience? Yeah. So what are the reactions of the students? I have to repeat the questions. I didn't do that with the last one. So what are the reactions of the students who need to train on this? I think um, yeah, they, they are very enthusiastic about it. They only saw the very preliminary versions, but they are very keen in, in getting hold of uh, of, the, of one of the machines. So at the moment, we're not at that phase. So no, they they are really really fond of it, and then they like it just to, to game. So. so when you had students try it, is it something they would want to play again? Have you done any user testing to see whether students keep playing the game? Um, the question is whether whether students uh, keep playing the game. Well, we are not at that level at the moment because we are only validate in the validation studies. So we can't afford to have one student sitting in in, in the room for, for 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 days because he's obstructing the progress of the validation studies. So, so I can't tell you at this moment. Yes. Did you face any challenges with this being sort of a, a medical training device in some ways? Are there any like regulatory challenges or anything? Like the question is uh, whether we face uh, problems with uh, um, reg re regulatory uh, issues on medical games. Um, this is a tricky question. <laughs> yes, um, of course we uh, we face that. So we are very very careful with that so we are not pretending in fact that we are building a simulator we are building a game and what we are aiming at is that the surgical world my friends are going to use it and they will probably tell themselves that it might be a useful tool so we don't pretend it's a, it's, it's a simulator they will uh, find out themselves that's <laughs> <laughs> Very political. <laughs> yes, please. Um, so I, I saw a study before that showed that surgeons that actually played any type of video game do significantly better on laparoscopic tests. 
Um, did you have plans to like kind of redo that with this game versus just any game, just to see if like you're teasing out even more skills beyond what just a normal Xbox yeah. game would do? Yeah, let's summarize the question. Um, there has been work uh, been done uh, testing uh, all sorts of uh, well, well, typical kind of games with a three three dimensional inside. Butch Rosser did that from New York. He did a lot of work on that, and he found that that sort of games were effective in in training uh, people. Um, and the question is, uh, are we uh, planning to have uh, a comparison between that sort of games and our game? Uh, yes, of course we are um, having that sort of uh, sort of uh, uh, um, uh, sort of comparing studies. Yeah, but again, this is only the because the real testing can only be done in fact after much more of the game is finished. So uh, we are a bit early. So what we did in, at this phase is just. Testing of the of the mechanics of the the, the whole the heart and soul of the whole whole machine. How accurate is the three three uh, D uh, positioning with infrared uh, system? And that's what we did at this moment. So, so we don't pretend to have done more than that. <laughs> yes. Please. So you had mentioned that, that there's technical training and then there's procedural. Yeah. So have you talked about going to the procedural? Because that that seems yes where the reuse would get in. Yeah. The, the question is, uh, um, in fact, any training, uh, at least a laparoscopic training, consists out of a technical part and a procedural part. And uh, are we already looking in the procedural part? Yes, we did. We abandoned completely the procedural part. We're staying away from it because, well, it's too complicated and it's too tricky. And then you're um, uh, uh, entering the minefield of, uh, of, 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 of lawyers, etc. So we are staying away. We don't pretend it. We only want them to play and have fun and keep playing. That's uh, that's important. The problem with most immersive games is that you have to warn the residents that they, they, they should practice more. We want to, to, to warn our practice that they should stop practicing because it's time for bed. That's, in fact, the way we want to go. Yes. Well, maybe it's not about the product, but more about the laparoscopic itself. Since the intersurgical, the Da Vinci system become very popular right now, do you see that in the near future, it's kind of the laparoscopic would totally be replaced by this intuitive instrument? Um, the question is um, how this is compared to the to the Da Vinci laparoscopic robot. It's called a robot. It's not a robot, but it's a mechanical device. Um, whether uh, how, how it does compare and how we see the future with uh, for perhaps games like this. Well, to be honest, um, the robot is very popular, um, but it hasn't made an enormous impact yet. It's a, it's a sort of university uh, tool. It's not a sort of tool for uh, or toy for surgeons. Uh, and it has not a real uh, database with uh, a real proven uh, um, extra um, functionality over open sur laparoscopic surgery. So it is a nice toy. It's very expensive. So it hasn't made an enormous impact yet. In the future, perhaps it, uh, it might make it. But it's, uh, at the moment, it's, they are not at that phase. It costs a fortune. The, the, the maintenance contract is cost another fortune. Um, and it costs a lot of time to set it up, etc. So, for instance, to give you an example, a standard laparoscopic cholecystectomy is done before you have tuned and calibrated the, the Da Vinci robot. So, so that's where we are at the moment with the Da Vinci, to be honest. Nothing against the Da Vinci, but it, is, it has a very limited use for specific indications, such as the prostatectomy. That's a very popular one. That's a, a nice confined area where you have to make a very delicate sort of combined movement. That's that's the, the, the place for the Da Vinci at the moment. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to wrap up questions now. I want to make sure that people get a chance to come down and take a look at the demo unit. Uh, and for those of you in Mountain View, uh, we're heading over to Big Table. If you're interested, you're welcome to join. Thank you very much for coming.